I'm not going to use it. So a uh, couple of opening comments before I get started. Um, <clears throat> I see this as a perfect place in the agenda. We've had the first hour and a half of uh, looking at, I'd say, what is the future, right? Eric and, and Dan both spoke of got to innovate, got to make changes, got to bring the cost down. It's going to take time. I want to shift gears a little bit. I want to talk to you about something that's here today that can help this situation. Um, one of the statistics that were thrown up, Dan put up a chart, said 7% plug-in hybrid and electric plug-in hybrid and electric vehicles by uh, 2020, I guess. What he didn't say is that there's technology today that if we started today in mass scale, by the time we got there, the energy that's gained from those 7% is not going to be anywhere near what would have been gained between now and then. I've done the analysis. I know how much we can save between now and then by forcing more aggressively the technologies that we have today. Being the CTO, I am a technology you know, guy, right? So some of this may sound like I'm bashing technology, but it's simply because I want to put it in a real context of what we can do today, not worrying about what we can do tomorrow. I am responsible for what's tomorrow at Maxwell. So when I make my comments about you know, technology development, how slow it is, how much it costs, et cetera, et cetera, please take it in the context of what we're trying to do today. Last thing, so now I've been at Maxwell almost 10 years, and uh, it pains me that I still have to ask the question of the audience. but. Everybody knows what an ultracapacitor is. If you don't, raise your hand. You never heard of one, raise your hand. And don't be embarrassed. <laughs> one guy, all right. I'll, I'll talk to you at lunch then. <laughs> That's fabulous. So maybe I don't have to ask that question too much anymore. Maybe I can stop asking that question. So really, this is perfect, the coming of age of ultracapacitors. It means they're ready. They're here. So what I'm going to talk about is the performance and the technology a little bit then product and market maturity, challenges to market adoption, and the next step forward in integrating them anywhere and everywhere. Because I believe that that's where we are right now with ultracapacitors. <clears throat> so this is a little bit of a different chart than Dan showed. This is a, a power versus energy chart. And you've all seen them. You all know power rich devices. Double layer capacitor, that's an ultracapacitor, right? All these other battery technologies have much, much higher energy, orders of magnitude in some cases. Um, but very little competes with the power capability of an ultracapacitor. It's unmatched by any large-scale technology today. Power is it. That's where it's at. Everybody says, ultracapacitors are so energy poor. Well, I say, so what? They are power rich. Can you? Get, can you get rid of that thing? <laughs> um, there's a, a power application or a power component to almost every energy delivery app, uh, you know, requirement that you can think of. I didn't mean get rid of the whole thing. I just oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, the traditional and advanced battery makers are trying everything they can. They're killing themselves to force power into these energy devices. And I think that's a bad way to go. It's a bad way economically. It's a bad way from runway lead time. If you were here last year, you heard John Miller talk, John Miller from Maxwell. And uh, I'm sure John talked about the combination of batteries and capacitors together. I'm not going to talk about that today, because that, that picture hasn't changed. It's only gotten more and more uh, relevant, I think, in the context of uh, a power device like an ultracapacitor coupled with an energy device like a battery. And I think we wouldn't have to wait so long if we would rely on batteries for energy and work harder on coupling batteries and capacitors together and use the power uh, devices for what they're good for. These battery makers are killing themselves and they're using your tax dollars to do it. It's okay. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to bash technology. That stuff has to be done. But you can't pick up the, the Wall Street Journal. You can't pick up any technical publication today without reading about this EV uh, this EV push and all the money that's going into electric vehicles and I'm here to tell you that by the time they get any sort of traction in the marketplace we would have gained a lot more by focusing on hybrid electric vehicles micro and mild hybrid we would be way ahead of the power curve we can't abandon that stuff no way I agree but 
let's take advantage of what sits here today. He said to be controversial and, you know, I'm, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. So one of the benefits of ultracapacitors from a technology perspective, charge and discharge cycles. This, this chart shows well over a million and a half cycles. And when we're talking about a cycle for an ultracapacitor, it's full voltage to half voltage. No battery can do it. None, no how, no way. You're talking about, you know, battery cycling down here, ultracapacitors, you know, out here. It's a pretty amazing capability. What you have to understand is, you know, you can't compare uh, the energy of an ultracapacitor and a battery, not lead acid, not lithium ion. They all have much more energy. But also the ultracapacitor is a different kind of animal. It's a true storage device. We'll refer to it as an electrostatic storage device. So you put it in and you take it out. It doesn't create anything. It's not an electrochemical conversion process inside. If there's electrochemical conversion going on, it's because we didn't do a good job making it. There's some impurity in there. There's something going on that shouldn't be there. Typically, you would want the ideal ultracapacitor to be perfectly pure and, uh, and have no contaminants. But water is everywhere. And of course, electrochemistry, you know, water promotes electrochemistry. So, But this kind of, of charge and discharge cycling at an efficiency that is between 95 and 99 percent, depending on the application, has some pretty serious implications in a power delivery application. The power performance, I said, is extraordinary. So what you see here is a real cycle for a uh, <clears throat> mild or um, a mild hybrid vehicle. It's actually a micro hybrid vehicle in this case. This is a starter sequence for uh, a hybrid vehicle that's on the road today that has ultracapacitors in it. So all you got to do is go to our website, you'll find out. I think Dan asked, what kind of battery is in all the 100% of the, the hybrid electric vehicles today? It's the nickel metal hydride. Well, what ultracapacitor is in 100% of the <laughs> you know, cranking applications on the road today? It's Maxwell's ultracapacitor. By the way, this is a shameless plug for ultracapacitor technology, not for Maxwell. I really am not selling Maxwell. I'm trying to promote the technology of ultracapacitors and power delivery and what it's really good for. So 50, millise oops, 50 milliseconds, 1,100 amps, 550 milliseconds, 600 amps. That's pretty demanding. And what that is is to recrank the engine during a start-stop application. So what you see here is uh, these happen to be Maxwell cells. It's the only data I can use. But you know, uh, it's a 650 farad cell. All, all ultracapacitors show this uh, characteristic capacitance drop early life. So we deliver it at 700. By the time it gets to where it needs to be, it's 650. So 125,000 cycles later, you've lost somewhere in the neighborhood of 10% of your capacitance from your nominal. 125,000 cycles, 1,100 amps, followed by 600 amps. Pretty, pretty good performance. The impedance of the device, or the resistance, goes up ever so slightly. The application calls for 600,000 cycles. The manufacturer of the vehicle that put these devices in for recranking the engine, so they don't use the battery to recrank the engine. You come to a stop sign. The ultracapacitors supply the power to recrank the engine because no battery can tolerate 600,000 cycles. And by the way, when it gets too cold, the battery kind of goes to sleep. You get much poorer power performance. At the AABC recently, uh, a poll was taken of the audience where they asked, how many of you have a hybrid electric vehicle? A lot of hands went up. How many of you have disabled it because of where you live and you get no benefit? And about half the hands went up. Batteries have a real, a real challenge at low temperature. Ultracapacitors don't. Down to minus 40, this curve's going to look about the same. The resistance goes up 2x, let's call it. In a battery, that 2x happens between 20 to 0, and then below 0, it goes up exponentially from there. So lots of cycles, very good stability, able to recrank, and the fuel savings, let's call it, They'll talk about 12 to 15%. Could be better, could be worse. It's really designed for a 
specific application of start-stop. If you're driving on the freeway all day long, not going to see that. Although now, the new talk is, let's get into what's being described as sailing, which is not only can you turn off the engine when you're coming to a stop, but you can also turn off the engine when you're coasting or when you're at freeway speed until you get down to a lower speed, then you start the engine again, and you'll need to crank it again. Perfect. Perfect for ultracapacitors. Calendar life. This is what we call DC life, if you will. All at 65 degrees C, sorry. 65 degrees C, these charts show. Two different voltages. You know, 2.7 volts is the nominal uh, commercially available ultracapacitor. Um, 2.5 volts is a lower if you want to derate it a little bit. Thousands and thousands of hours of DC life before your capacitance drops. And by the way, these, these are arbitrary end-of-life targets for the industry. 80% capacitance, doubling of the resistance. That's what the design points usually are. If you want to design around 70, go for it. You want to design around more than doubling the resistance, you can do that too. That's a, a not as good a way to go because these are power devices. When the resistance starts to go, then you start to impinge on your power performance. But fundamentally, extremely good life, calendar life. So key capacitor technologies continue to advance as well. I just stated 2.7 volts is the nominal operating voltage of a of an ultracapacitor. So you want to put 125 volts of these things together, you need 48 of them. But what if we could operate at 3 volts instead of 2.7 volts and you wanted to put 125 of them together, or 125 volts of them together? You need fewer cells, you get a lighter package, you get a more cost-effective package. It's on the horizon. It's a big deal in the industry if you're not close to ultracapacitor industry. People have been trying it for a long time. I'm here telling you today that it's on the horizon. It's coming, and it's coming in our lifetime. It's not coming five years from now. It's coming now. I'm not going to tell you when exactly. 